Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait a few moments and allow everyone time to log on and join us. Welcome, welcome. We're still just allowing people time to join on. Okay, we are going to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Becoming Nocturnal, a glimpse into monitoring Northern Sawwet Owls with Jennifer Wall. Hawk Mountain Autumn 2018, conservation science trainee and PhD candidate in the wildlife biology program with the W.A. Frank College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. Welcome, Jennifer. Hey, I'm happy to be here. We are happy you're joining us. And we're also so glad everyone in the audience is able to join us today as well. My name is Jamie Dawson, and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Welcome. <laughs> as you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education, locally and globally all over the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members out there, we extend much gratitude to you for your continued support. So thank you, thank you. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit their questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform, and we've designated some time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are absolutely thrilled that Jennifer Wall is joining us today all the way from Montana uh, to teach us about monitoring northern sawwet owls. Before we go further, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Jennifer's background experiences with our audience. Wildlife ecologist Jen Wall is a PhD candidate at the University of Montana, where she is currently looking at how the changing environment will impact small mammals living at high elevations in Alaska. Her research takes her to Denali National Park in the summers, where she hikes through the backcountry, collecting information on where animals like pika, marmots, and ground squirrels currently live, so she can predict how they will be impacted as their habitats change. Prior to starting her dissertation work in 2019, Jen worked at the Patuxent Research Center in collaboration with both USGS and the Chesapeake Bay Conservation Corps monitoring water birds in the Chesapeake Bay. She spent a season in Maine banding sawwet owls in 2017 and joined Hawk Mountain Sanctuary as a trainee in the autumn of 2018. Jen, you have been doing some really fabulous things and please take me with you to Alaska. I want to go. <laughs> so Jen, what inspired you to pursue a PhD in the field of wildlife biology and conservation? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome to come to Alaska anytime and visit. Um, so I am really interested in getting a PhD to help improve my understanding of how climate change um, is impacting and will continue to impact both populations and communities of animals, including people. Um, and one way to continue learning and doing research is to become a researcher. So I get to ask those big questions and try to answer them. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, so Jen, would you mind sharing with our audience how you became involved with Hawk Mountain? Yeah, you know, that story is a little bit related to what we're gonna talk about today. Um, to not give away anything, I was doing research with people who collaborate with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and was looking for my next step at the end of that job. 
And so they put me in contact with someone at Hawk Mountain and I talked to them and decided it was an awesome program and I really wanted to join um, for the fall of 2018. Awesome. Well, we're so glad we did. It was fabulous having you as on our team. And now you're, you can never leave. You're a part of our extended family forever. <laughs> um, so Jennifer, uh, what experiences at Hawk Mountain have helped you the most with your current work? Yeah. So while I was at Hawk Mountain, I was able to meet and collaborate with this awesome team and resources that are at Hawk Mountain. Um, and that gave me a lot of skills that have been really important for both my current work and hopefully my future work. Um, and it led to uh, what, we're gonna, what we're gonna be talking about today. Awesome, awesome. And speaking of what we're gonna be talking about, Jennifer, I'm gonna hand it over to you. We have people who are excited to learn about monitoring the Northern Sawwet Owl. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you all could join me today. As Jamie mentioned, my name is Jen Wall, and I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Montana. So today, you guys are going to join me on a nocturnal adventure, looking at how we monitor northern solid owl populations through Project Owlnet. And to take a look at current owl population trends in this webinar titled Becoming Nocturnal, a glimpse into how we monitor northern solid owl populations. So first things first, what is a northern solid owl? So these guys are pretty tiny. They're about the size of a soda can. They've got big heads, bright yellow eyes, and they're mottled brown and white with this deep white V between their eyes. Um, and they are one of the smallest owls in North America. They are also what's called a nocturnal raptor. So to break that down a bit further, nocturnal means that they're active at night. So during the nighttime is when they're doing all of their moving around, all of their hunting, all of their migration. And then raptor means that they are a bird that are distinguished by a couple specific characteristics. Um, the first is that they've got these sharp talons that allow them to catch prey. They've got a hooked beak, which allows them to tear things apart. And they're also predators, so they eat mostly meat. Now, these guys are pretty secretive as far as owls go. They can fly really quietly, and when they're threatened, they stay really still so that you can't see them. And of course, they are adorable. So they are ranked among the most adorable species of owls, unofficially, of course, among a bunch of different websites. And I tend to agree. All right, so Northern solid owls live in forested habitats like this. They prefer to inhabit these large, intact, usually pretty mature forests in relatively inaccessible areas. And so mature forests are forest stands that have trees that are at least 60 years old. So they've been around for a while. And here is a map of their range. And so you can see in the purple, that is their year round range. And so the purple, if you're looking at this map of North America, goes across Southern Canada and then down through the Rockies. And so this is the area that they're around or that they're in year round, um, which is also the area that they're breeding in in the springtime. And so Northern solid owls typically breed in the spring and their breeding season usually lasts from about March to July. They have clutch sizes of around four to seven eggs, and they nest in holes in dead trees, which are also called snags. Um, they, they have been known to nest in nest boxes as well, just like the American kestrels in the nest box project at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. So a lot of people will put up nest boxes to encourage owls in their area that are breeding in the springtime to nest there and give them a place to nest. Um, and their babies are equally adorable. So here you can see four different juvenile northern solid owls. So that means they were born that year. Um, and they're also known as hatch year birds. And these guys are a little different looking than the adults. So you can see they've got this red cinnamon colored belly and they're a lot more brown and not very spotted, but they've got that same white V in between their eyes. All right, so if we look back at this map, 
The purple areas on southern Canada and down the Rockies are those breeding areas. But if you look into the blue areas now, these are the non-breeding or the migration areas. And so in the winter um, and in the fall, they're going to leave those breeding areas that they were in in the spring and they're going to head south for the winter. So they're leaving those purple zones and they're heading south to these blue areas. And if you look on the east coast, you can see that that blue travels as far down as central Florida. And that means that in the fall, some of these owls are migrating as far south as Florida for the winter. So the northern solid owl fall migration usually takes place as early as August to September and then continues on through late November, early December. So they're on the move for pretty much all of fall. Um, and they usually travel the same routes every year. So they have what's called a high root fidelity. For our purposes, we're gonna be focusing on the population that travels down the East Coast. So down where this black arrow is on our map. Now, the other thing to note about their migration is that they're what's called eruptive migrants. And what does that mean exactly? Well, to get to that, we're gonna to have to unpack a couple of things. First, northern solid owls eat small mammals, mostly deer, mice, and voles. And one prey in particular that is really important in their population cycles is the red-backed vole, which is pictured here. And now this vole eats seeds from the cones of conifer trees, like the Douglas fir, pictured here. And the Douglas fir will drop cones full of seeds and these massive cone crops every three to five years. And so this means that every three to five years, you have these giant droppings of cones that are full of seeds and the voles have a ton of food. So the vole populations increase like crazy. And because our solid owls feed on the voles, they in turn also increase. And so you can see on this map, um, we've got time on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we're looking at both vole populations over time and changes in our hatch years or our juveniles of solid owls over time. And you can see that they track pretty well together. So when there's lots of voles, there's a lot of solid owls that are born that year. And where there aren't as many voles, there aren't as many solid owls born. And so you can see the cyclic nature of these population patterns in action. And so what exactly does that mean? So it means that if you have a year with lots of cone crops, there's lots of seed, lots of food for those voles. And so the voles are going to expand their populations. Lots of babies will be born. And now there's lots of food for our solid owls. So the solid owls will have tons of voles to eat and they're going to have lots of solid owl babies. And so that means that next fall, all of those babies are going to need somewhere to go. So there's this massive eruptive movement of owls that are migrating south. And so they're called eruptive migrants because of these pulses in reproduction. So these years with lots of solid owls um, that are like an eruption moving south every three to five years. All right, so if we combine this information, we know that the owls are nocturnal, so they're active during the nighttime. They're pretty secretive, so they're quiet and they're hard to spot. And they like to live in these mature, relatively inaccessible forests. And they also occur at low population densities. So all of these things combine to make them appear really rare. So they're super hard to detect. And for a while, people thought that they were really rare in nature. And so it was what's called this perceived rarity of the owls, where people are like, well, I can't see them, so they must be really rare. So given that, how do we know all of this information about them and their migration patterns? Well, we didn't always know that much about solid owls. Throughout the 1800s, people knew about solids but they're so secretive and so elusive that we didn't see them very often. And when people did see them, it wasn't in large groups, like when you think about massive broadwing hawk migrations, and they never saw them on the move. 
So everyone thought that they were residents. And that means we thought that they stayed in the same area all year round. And we also didn't think there were that many of them. Now that started changing as people started encountering these owls in places that they weren't expecting them. And in 1911, in Southern Ontario, these two people named Taverner and Swales ended up finding some dead owls in a place that they really weren't expecting them. So they decided to go searching in the trees to see if they could find more. And in less than two hours, they found 12 owls hiding in the trees. They were like, this is amazing. There's so many owls here. We have to share this with people. And so they ended up coming back the next day with a friend to be like, hey, look at all these owls. And there were no owls there. So that means that in that one day, there went from lots of owls in these woods to none. And so they're sitting there thinking, hmm, well, these owls had to have come from somewhere and they had to have gone somewhere. So maybe these guys are actually migrants. And then if you fast forward all the way to the 1960s, um, people had started banding um, during the night. They were capturing things. And so if we go to the Cedar Grove Ornitho Ornithological Station in Wisconsin, Mueller and Berger ended up capturing a whole bunch of owls with their mist nets during the fall migration season. And they were like, man, given all of these numbers of owls that we're capturing, maybe they're not only migrants, but they're really common fall migrants. And so because of that, a couple different groups of people across North America started banding solid owls. One of them, Ta Tom Erdman, was out banding owls at Little Swamico Ornithological Station in Wisconsin. And it was a pretty slow fall, so they weren't catching a lot of owls. But he had this idea to take an answering machine out with a recording of a solid owl call, and he started playing it to see what would happen. Well, wouldn't you know it? They caught more than 10 times the owls they had without the call. And so this is what's known as an audio lore. And it was huge and has changed the way that we trap and band our solid owls. Though we don't use an answering machine anymore. So one of his students was a man named Dave Brinker. And Dave had banded solids with Tom in Wisconsin. So when he moved south to Maryland for grad school, he and some other grad students got together. And they were like, hmm, well, this area looks similar to Wisconsin. I wonder if there are any northern solid owls down here. So they put a bunch of nets out and they caught owls. And this surprised a lot of people who didn't think they would be there. Now, what is the benefit of banding these birds, right? Why band owls? So when we say that we are banding owls, we're referring to these metal leg bands. And these are bands that are issued by the Breeding Bird Laboratory, which is a part of the USGS. Now you need a permit to get them. So you do need to be a professional bird bander. And they do issue and keep track of every single metal band they've given out and every bird that's been banded. There are over 77 million banding records of birds. And each of these bands has a unique identifier. And that helps us to identify and track individuals. So let's say this bird, um, this solid owl that's on my arm on the right hand of this PowerPoint, I caught it and I banded it. And then the next year, someone else catches that same owl. Well, we've got this identifier on the metal band that tells us exactly what individual that is. So they can say, hey, I have this owl that's been banded and then they'll know where that owl has been because I was the one that put that band on it. And so we can track where that owl goes over time as more and more people recapture that owl and read that band again. Um, and so this is especially important because these birds are pretty hard to find in traditional surveys. Northern solid owls are pretty secretive and they're not observed super often. And a lot of bird surveys take place at dawn. Um, and even if they don't take place at dawn and you're surveying them at night, 
they don't always call. And so a lot of times their calls are influenced by the prey populations around. So you might be walking in an area and there's lots of owls there, but you don't see them and you can't really hear them. So by banding the owls, we can catch more than we can see and we can track them. And this is huge in providing information on where they're going and how the populations are doing. So banding birds is incredibly important. And here we are in the early 1990s now, and there are a couple of places that had started banding solid owls across North America, but they needed a way to help share the information they were getting with each other and to standardize what they were doing. So it was consistent between stations. That way they could compare what was happening in one place to what was happening somewhere else. And thus began Project Alnet, which was the brainchild of Dave Brinker. Project Alnet was founded in 1994 with the goal of contributing to owl conservation and encouraging, facilitating, and coordinating the monitoring of owl population trends by misnetting and banding migrant owls. Project Alnet is based out of the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art under Scott Widensall in Millersburg, Pennsylvania. So pretty close to home. And when you look at this goal that they have, it sounds pretty lofty, right? How do you contribute to owl conservation? And so the first thing that they did for Project Alnet is they established a listserv called SawwetNet. Um, which is now called Project Alnet at googlegroups.com. And this allowed them to share information about any owls that they recaptured from other places, as well as information about when the owls started moving in different spots every year. And it gave them a forum to ask each other questions. They could say, hey, I have this owl. It was doing something that surprised me or that was unusual. Has anyone seen this before? And so it became this collaborative bird banding effort. The second thing that they did is they standardized monitoring protocols um, with requirements for ornithologists interested in joining as a new banding station. So banding stations need to be able to commit to a long-term amount of time. So they usually say at least five years, but preferably more than a decade. And they're looking for a constant annual effort. So every fall season, they need to have a certain amount of days where they have those nets open and they're looking for those owls. They need standardized netting protocol. And so Hawk Mountain, um, sorry, Project Alnet does provide this netting protocol that they suggest, but people are welcome to shift it around a little bit if there are things that make more sense in their specific locations. Um, and then they also need to have those audio lures in use. And so Project Alnet led to this widespread misnetting and targeted surveys. And by the late 1990s, it started really taking off. So this photo on the right, um, it is about a decade old, but you can see these banding stations across North America. By now, there are at least 125 active banding stations with a lot more out in the Western part of North America than we currently have in this map. And what we've learned from Project Alnet is that Northern Solwet owls are one of the most common North American owls. They migrate South every fall and North every spring between these breeding areas in southern Canada and these non-breeding areas further south into, into the U.S. Now Project Alnet specifically targets this fall migration as they're heading south. And we've also learned that most individuals in a population move, so they are primarily migratory. And this is a complete 180 switch in mindset from before we started trapping them. And a really positive outcome because we went from man, these owls seem like they're really rare. We never really see them to, oh my gosh, they're super common and they migrate all the time. 
And Project LNET also allows us to assess these populations over time with all of this banding data. And so this is what we mean when we say widespread misnetting. Labeled here from the 1960s, excuse me, to the 1980s, you can see that there was some owl banding going on. But once Project Alnet starts in the 1990s, the number of solids being banded every year increases significantly. As of 2016, northern solid owls were the most banded owl in North America at over 291,000 solid owls banded in total. And there's so much we can learn from this data. Now, you might be asking, why am I the one here talking to you about all of this, right? What is my part in this story? So my part of this st journey starts in Maryland in 2017. So about four years ago, I had collaborated with Dave Brinker while working as a field technician in the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, studying and banding water birds. And so he introduced me to Project Almet. And it turns out they needed someone at a migration station up in Maine that fall. And he asked if I would be willing to head that station for the season. So I was sitting here like, man, a trip to Maine to ban these awesome owls all fall, I'm in. And that is how I became nocturnal. So I drove up to Maine and I spent the fall being nocturnal. So I woke up as the sun was going down and I banded owls all night. And then I went to sleep as the sun was coming up for the day. So I became nocturnal in order to catch and collect data on these owls in Maine. And the next year after I left, um, I heard about Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and all of the awesome resources and opportunities here. So I decided I wanted to join the traineeship program in the fall of 2018. And I used part of that time while I was there to work on writing a manuscript about the Solwet owls and how they're doing. But first, so I'm here in Maine catching owls, but how do you catch and collect data on owls, right? Well, you can break it down into a couple steps. Step one, you gotta catch the owl. So how do we catch these owls? The primary way is through mist nets. So this picture on the right is a picture of a closed mist net in my station up in Maine. Um, here is a drawing of what they look like when they're open. So you can see that it's this mesh um, that's about 60 millimeter mesh that you open up and it creates these pockets in the mesh. Um, in the drawing, there are four pockets. Typically, the nets that we use have three different pockets. And so what's the point of those pockets? So picture this. We've got an owl that's migrating through the area. There's an audio lure playing a solid owl call. And so this owl hears that call and comes to investigate, right? They're like, hmm, that call is interesting. Let me go check it out. So they fly closer to that call and they don't see the net and they end up flying right into the net. And so when they fly into the net, they hit it and they fall into one of those pockets. And then we can come by and we can take them out of the pocket. So there you can see by this arrow would be the path of the saw wet owl as it's flying in and then landing in one of our pockets. All right, so because they are nocturnal, you have to trap them at night when they're moving. Typically, banding stations are open from dusk to dawn or sunset to sunrise. And this is what it looks like at dusk at the start of a banding night. And so here is a glimpse of what it might look like to walk along the line of mist nets. You can see that it's night, so I've got a headlight on to light the way. And you can hear a call playing in the background. If you recall, 
that's the audio lore. So that's what increased our owl capture rates in misnets tenfold. So to get a little closer of a listen, here is that audio lore recording. So as you listen to their call, you might be able to hear why they got their name. So they got their name because it sounds a little bit like a saw that's being sharpened on a wedding stone. Um, hence, saw wet owl. All right, so as you're walking along the net, checking for owls, this is what you might see if an owl is actually caught in the net. So they fly in, they bounce into the net, and then they get stuck in that pocket. Now, the capture and banding of any wild bird is very strictly governed by federal, state, and professional laws, and it's illegal to do without the necessary permits. So that's why we have professional permitted ornithologists that are trained in handling these birds who are coming to check these nets and extract the birds safely from the net without hurting them while keeping this constant effort to make sure they're keeping both the owls and themselves safe. Once the owls are caught, we place them in mesh bags so they can breathe and take them to our banding station to be processed. So here you can see a number of owls that were just caught that are hanging in the banding station waiting for their turn to be processed and then released back into the night. So we try to keep them for as short a time as possible and make the banding process as efficient as possible. And so this is because we don't wanna disrupt their migration too much. Our goal is to be as minimally invasive as possible while still getting the information that we need from them in order to understand more about their populations and to help them. However, every once in a while, even with all of our precautions, an owl might get hurt in the process. Usually, this means that they sprained their wing in the net. Um, it's pretty rare and doesn't happen super often. In Maine, we set up what I like to call an owl hotel. And this is to help take care of these guys if they do get injured. And so we've got small enclosures in our owl hotel to make them feel safe and netting on the back so that they've got temperature regulation and airflow. And so one of these guys on the right that you can see in my picture did sprain their wing the year that I was there banding. And they stayed with me for about three days until their wing was fully healed and they could continue on in their migration path. All right, so step one, catch the owl. So we've caught our owl. We now have the owl in custody. Now that we've got the owl, we need to record information about it. So we record all kinds of information about these owls from things like eye color. So you can see me here looking at this owl and trying to compare the shade of yellow in that owl. I mean, we think this might help us learn more about the health conditions of the owls. We also record things like their weight. So here you can see an owl in this little orange juice can with holes punctured into the bottom so that they can still breathe. Um, and we keep them on that scale as little time as possible and then immediately turn them right side up again. But this way we can weigh them without them moving around and potentially getting hurt. And then we also record information about their wings, their beaks, and their tail lengths. So you can see this guy being set up to measure its wing cord, that wing length measurement. And it's turning around and staring at us for the camera. And then we also record information on their age. So Northern Solwit owls have this awesome feature when you go to age them. Like a couple other owls, like barred owls, for instance, their new feathers fluoresce under UV light. And so you can see here, this guy is a juvenile. How do I know that? So 
because they're juvenile, that means they were born this year. And so they had to grow all of their adult feathers this season. And so that means that all of their feathers are new. And so only the new feathers will fluoresce under UV light. And so if all of their feathers are glowing, then we know that they're a juvenile. Now, what do new feathers look like in general? So you can see this top picture is of a juvenile or a hatchier, so an animal that was born this year. And this owl has beautiful feathers. They've got this rich, saturated, dark brown color, and there's very little damage on any of those feathers. So this would be a first year or a hatch year owl. And this is in contrast to this photo at the bottom, which is of a second year or adult. And so between their first year and their second year, they're going to molt and regrow some of their feathers. But it's a lot of work to regrow all of your feathers. And so instead, these guys will molt and regrow their outer primaries and their inner secondaries. So if you look at this owl, that's kind of the outside edges of their wings. And so if you look at the outside edges of the wings of this owl, they look pretty dark and they look beautiful and similar in color to the picture above. But if you look at those inside feathers, so those inner primaries and outer secondaries, you can see that the feathers are pretty old and faded. And they're definitely not as rich of a brown color, right? They're pretty light brown. And so this is a pattern that is traditional for second year adults. So when we're looking at our owls, we can look at them and see if they have that pattern. And if you're unsure about any owl, you can put them under that UV light and see if their feathers glow. So for our second year adult, only those outer primaries and inner secondaries are gonna glow. Everything in the middle isn't gonna glow. And then we also record after second year as an age. So pretty much any other feather, feather pattern where it looks like they're starting to molt out some of those older feathers and regrow those over time um, is usually an owl that's older than two years. All right. So the last thing that we do is we're recording information about these owls as we attach the metal leg bands. And this is the whole point and extremely important for collecting data on these owls. Um, these leg bands help us to identify the birds. That way, if someone catches them, they'll know when and where those birds have been caught before. The oldest saw wet owl ever recaught was over nine years old. So they can live to at least nine years in the wild. Now, if you recall this photo from earlier, here is a saw wet that is finished being processed and is being released back into the night to continue migrating. So we like to give them time to adjust from the bright light of our banding station back to the dark of the night and allow them to fly whenever they're ready by placing them on our hand or arm and waiting. Eventually, they will take off and they'll fly into the night to continue their migration. Now, we talked about the history and the start of Project Elnet, where there was this perceived rarity of the owls, but then we realized that they're actually pretty common. However, owls are facing a number of increasing challenges, such as increasing forest loss and fragmentation along their ranges. If you'll recall from earlier, sawwits eat small mammals like voles and mice. They do this by perching on tree branches to hunt them and then swooping down and grabbing them. And if there aren't enough trees, it could become a lot harder for them to find good perches to hunt or find enough prey. And that's especially hard for those young juveniles who are still learning. So they're not as good at catching voles. They're not as good at finding good perches. So if there are fewer there, it's going to be a lot harder for them and a lot harder for them to survive. So given that we have all this amazing data on populations from Project Alnet and all the effort of the banding stations, and there are these increasing threats, we wanted to know where are populations today. At one point, we thought these owls were rare, only to find out that they're a very common North American migrant. Is that still true? Is this a species we should be concerned about? And if so, 
How concerned should we be? What have we learned through our widespread misnetting efforts? Well, to get at this, I collaborated with researchers from Project Alnet to look at what is happening to our populations that move down the East Coast in this paper titled 25 Year Population Trends in Northern Solwet Owl in Eastern North America. Because of their population fluctuations and their eruptive migration years, there's a lot of noise associated with their migration data. And that means that there is a lot of variation from year to year. So because of this, we needed a long-term data set from the area. So I pulled together our resources and it turns out we had seven Project Alnet migration sites down the East Coast with long-term monitoring data whose researchers wanted to participate and help us answer this question of how populations are doing. So we ended up with banding data from seven sites from over a 25 year period, ranging from 1992 to 2017, all across Eastern North America. And we wanted to see how populations were doing. So because there are eruptive years where lots of juveniles are born, we looked at trends overall, but we also broke them up into trends between adults and juveniles separately. And so this is called age class population trends. And here's a picture of our banding sites with the location and years of operation. You can see our sites range from as far north as Tadoussac in Quebec, all the way down to Assateague in Southern Maryland. And there's this high level of variation over time. So here's an example from a site in Small Valley, Pennsylvania where the total number of owls migrating is shown in black dots um, with time on the x-axis. And so you can see there are these eruptive years in 2007, 2012, and 2016, where we have a lot more owls than there were in previous years. Now, you might be asking what happened in those early 2000s, right? There should theoretically, if it's a three to five year trend, be another bump right there. And unfortunately, populations were impacted by the West Nile virus in the early 2000s. And so a lot of researchers think that's a reason we don't see an eruption trend that year. Now, how did we analyze this data? So every site is pretty variable. And so we need to standardize our effort to account for those differences. If you're looking at our nets, a lot of people will have different amounts of nets. They could have their nets open for different amounts of time. They could have a different number of days that they're open based on where they are. And some people have what are called double high nets. So our traditional nets are about three pockets high, but you can also have nets that are six pockets high. And so we needed to standardize all of that information that we were gathering to account for all of these things. And what we ended up doing is analyzing our population trends over time. And so we were looking for a way to explain the variation in population trends um, in a way that matched among the sites. So is there some explainable variation among the sites? that matches. And what did we find? So we ended up having information on over 27,000 owls that were trapped and banded over all of our sites over that 25 year period. There was a lot of variability between all of those years. When we were looking at our data, we didn't find any significant population trends for our total owl count, our adults, or our juveniles. And we confirmed this trend through the Christmas bird count data. However, we did see some potential foreshadowing of future population declines. Now, what does this mean, having no significant population trends? It could mean a couple things. So one, our populations could be pretty stable, which would be really exciting. We'd like our populations to be stable. It could also mean that any trends that might be occurring aren't occurring very fast. 
and they're not occurring fast enough for us to detect them with the level of variability that we have in this population through our eruptions, the West Nile virus, and other things like that. So if the populations are declining really slowly, we might not be able to see that yet and could also get a non-significant population trend. Now, at this point, we've added a couple more years of data under our belt. So it would be awesome to be able to run this again in the future with an even longer data set and see if we find anything different. So it's a pretty happy ending for these guys so far. We know that banding data is extremely valuable for monitoring the regional population status of owls. And overall, our northern solid owl populations are likely pretty stable across eastern North America. But we should still monitor them and keep looking for those potential declines and population trends. And this means that we need to keep Project Downnet going. And everything is pretty interconnected. We're currently facing immense threats worldwide from climate changes, which are impacting both humans and animals at all levels. So we need to keep in mind these positive stories, but also be vigilant that things could and are changing really fast. And so we need to protect the habitats and keep monitoring populations like this one in anticipation of that. In terms of Project Alnet, they have no plans of slowing down anytime soon. The project has grown so big in such a short span of time that it's been a bit of a challenge to keep up with all of the amazing information that everyone from over 125 banding stations are collecting. So they're looking to modernize their data systems to make them more automated, similar to the way that Nature Counts runs in Canada. And this would allow us to make even bigger comparisons between banding stations and to provide more services to banding stations, like faster feedback on foreign recaptures. And so we're always looking for ways to improve the project and make it more efficient. Automating the data systems is a pretty big step. And currently, they haven't been able to come up with the funds and the man hours to make that happen. So it is still a project in the works, but I would keep a lookout in the future. Now, some of you may be thinking, these owls are awesome and adorable and I'd love to help, but what can I do? So one of the best things you can do is spread the word and talk to your friends and family about these owls. The more people we have talking about science, the more well-informed everyone can be. And then more people can learn about and participate in our project. Now, if you wanted to go even further than that, you could find a banding station near you and apply to become a trained volunteer for Project Alnet. And depending on local health conditions and guidance, you could also ask your local banding station if they do educational group visits to see and learn about the process up close and bring other people in to learn about it too. And of course, you can help with all kinds of other conservation and science projects that are going on, even if you can't get directly involved with the owls. There are so many opportunities to help the wildlife and to help scientists. Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is a great resource for finding, finding opportunities nearby in Pennsylvania. And with that, I wanted to thank everyone for coming, as well as my co-authors, JF from Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, Dave Brinker from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Scott Widensall from the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art, David Okines from Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory, Pascal Cote from Tadasac Bird Observatory, as well as Project Alnet for making all of this happen, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary for all of their resources and help during the analysis and writing of the paper, the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art for um, housing Project Alnet, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and the Petit Manan National Wildlife Refuge for all of their help with our banding station up in Maine, as well as the volunteer banders in Maine and my partner, Alex and dog Mako for all of their continued support. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that people have. Jen, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I learned so much and I love how you broke everything down into simple steps. Um, it was great. And saw what owls definitely have my vote for one of the most adorable <laughs> avian species. So, um, okay, questions are coming in. Are you ready? 
Yes. All right. Question number one. Did you ever catch the same owl multiple times? I didn't, but I know that other people have. So sometimes owls will stay in an area for a couple days. And so you could have an owl that you banned one night and then a day or two later, you capture that same exact owl. So I have heard of that, but I did not catch one. Thank you. Um, okay, so this question is, um, hello, <laughs> new feathers from a second year are not confused with the first year? Nope. Um, so because those first years are growing all new feathers, you're just looking at the pattern of feather growth. So you can see those new feathers that are all over the wing for those juveniles versus those second years, which only have them on the outsides. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Is there a difference between weight, color, and size between males and females? There is. Yes. So um, I actually have a slide on that. So one of the ways that we are determining sex of our owls, oh, if this will move, there we go, is through a chart like this. And so this chart is how we are determining if they're males or females. And so what we do is we actually look at a combination of their weight and the length of their wings. So that wing cord length plus their weight. And so owls with a pretty low weight and that low wing cord are usually males and then um, owls that have those heavier weights for that wing cord length are typically our females. And then there is a range in between where we record them as unknown because they could be either. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Um, the questions keep coming in. All right. Um, is there a project uh, owner in the Broome County, New York area? I would love to volunteer from Jen. No. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there is. Um, one way you could figure that out is either to Google it and see if they have any sort of web presence or to go onto that listserv. And you can email the listserv and just say, hey, I'm in this area. Is anyone banding owls near me? And so theoretically, anyone in that area will respond and say, hey, we are like, come help us. Awesome. What a great, you know, collaborative resource, as you mentioned. Um, who are the predators of the owls? Hmm. So the owls have a ton of different predators, ranging from just larger owls, like boreal owls and other things, to um, bigger raptors. And so pretty much it's just other raptors that are bigger than them that will usually eat them. Okay, thank you. Jen, do solwets happily share territory with other owls? What are the natural predators of solwets, which I think you just answered anyway, so. Yeah, so... I'm not sure if they do share happily with anything. It is hard to, you know, ascribe any sort of happiness to these owls um, in that sense. But I do know that their ranges overlap with a lot of other owl species. So they do live in areas with other owls. Um, and then they are really tiny. So they are prey for a lot of those bigger owls. I can imagine a great horn would uh, go for one. Um, okay, these are great questions. I love them. Jen, how do you determine the position of a mist net for a given site? And was that one of the differences you analyzed between the seven sites on the East Coast? Great question. So we did not account for the positioning of the mist nets. Um, a lot of what we found, well, so I guess there is some standardized protocol for how those nets are positioned. But what we found is a lot of times if the owl is honing in on that audio lure, they're actually going to circle around it. And so your mist, mist net can be placed in pretty much a bunch of different directions and that owl will still run into it as they're circling. So the orientation of it doesn't actually matter that much. Nice. Thank you. Okay, next question. Since solwets are cavity nesters, are they competing with other species that use the same nesting areas? What are the main competitors? Yeah, so I don't know too much about their breeding um, as I mostly work with their fall migration, but I do know that they typically will use older um, nests from other things. So they'll actually come in after a bird has already made a nest in that area and then take over it. So it'll be kind of an old abandoned spot that they're then using for themselves. 
Thanks, Jen. And this next question is kind of related. And I know you just mentioned you don't really work with the breeding aspect of it. But uh, the question was, do you ever handle and count the baby chicks? And if not you personally, are you aware of other scientists out there doing that? Yeah, so I do not. Um, but I do know that there are scientists that are out there banding those baby chicks, um, mostly in southern Canada. So there is a big um, group of researchers that are looking at their breeding and monitoring a lot of their breeding um, during the springtime. And so that would be typically in those more northern parts of their range. Thank you. More questions, Jen. <laughs> the audience wants to know. Um, are northern sawwets also known as Acadian owls? I don't know the answer to that one. I don't either. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to look that up after this program. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, will a Solwet uh, utilize a Kestrel nest box? I am not sure. So you would have to look at the nest box sizes. Um, I do know that they're, they'll only nest in certain areas in the boreal forest. And so they are higher in latitude than, you know, the, the nest boxes in Pennsylvania um, for the Kestrels. But it is possible there is some overlap. Um, so it would depend on kind of that, that size requirement. Right, thank you. Um, and so this next question is just kind of clarifying um, that the Northern Solwets are only migrating at night? Yes, yeah, so um, they migrate at night. Um, that's when they're pretty active, so they are nocturnal. Um, I have heard from people that there are records of them just moving around, so they get a little restless during the day and they'll kind of shift from one perch to another in kind of a local area, but they're not gonna be migrating long distances during the day. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think that's all the questions. Um, awesome. Thank you to the audience, fantastic questions there. Thank you for joining us. And Jennifer, phenomenal speaker. I love your presentation. The photos, you're like, <laughs> oh, it's perched on my arm. I loved it. Thank you for sharing your wonderful experiences and all of your knowledge on the Solwets. Um, what a treasure. So thank you so much. Um, so compliments are coming in in the chat, Jennifer. <laughs> Our next stay at home speaker series is on Thursday, October 28th at 7 p.m. with Todd Barnell. And the title of that presentation is Ecological and Cultural Keystone Species, the Yurok Tribes California Condor Project. So don't miss that one. Um, we hope to see you at Hawk Mountain soon. It is spectacular fall migration. The broad wings are coming through. Come visit us. It is just a wonderful experience. Um, we have a lot of upcoming programs as well. And also during um, migration weekends, we have tons of free programming all day, Saturdays and Sundays during fall migration, including live raptor presentations. You don't want to miss it. Um, tomorrow, the 24th, we have Members Day in the bookstore. Discounts, discounts, discounts. What? You don't want to miss that. This Saturday, uh, September 25th at 5 p.m., we have a very special autumn lecture with Dr. Keith Bildstein talking about his latest book, Avian Spies, Critical Insights into the Not-So-Secret Lives of Vultures, and that's in our amphitheater. Um, Sunday, this Sunday, September 26th, we have Yoga on the Mountain at 9 a.m. in our education building. Thursday, September 30th, we have a 6 p.m. member mixer at Hope Hill Lavender Farm, which is absolutely stunning. Um, Saturday, October 2nd, at 2 p.m., we have Global Nature Rhythm Drum Experience. And Wednesday, October 6th, at 10 a.m., we have our We Ones Walk. The theme is Altober, and that's for our toddler group. So I'm going to stop at October 6th, <laughs> and, um, but we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for everything, and have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are. Thanks again. Bye for now.